but if you've got your Bibles this morning, we're, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 31st verse, and then we're going to read the first three verses of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Um, and as you guys are turning there, I've got a story to tell. And I, my daughter said she was going to make a compilation of my stories, but they got too long. So, uh, but again, if you can't be here with us today, we really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, and what is our Facebook address, Hannah? F is it at FCC Hamilton OH? At FCC Hamilton OH. A couple people asked me and, uh, that are on the radio so they can watch us more. So at FCC Hamilton OH. And that will plug you into our Facebook uh, feed. And it's usually live every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night. This coming Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. If you can't come out and be with us, uh, tune us into uh, Facebook around 7.30. Brother Dave Charles will be ministering this coming Wednesday night. So looking forward to that. But anyway, the story. Uh, it's, it happened in the Ozarks down in Branson. Uh, they had a passion play. We're in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, <laughs> 31st verse. All right, 1 Corinthians 12th chapter, 31st verse, and then 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, first three verses. But anyway, at Branson, uh, they used to have a passion play there. They still have a passion play around Easter time. Um, but uh, several years ago, there was a guy there that was portraying Jesus. And as he was walking along that... Uh, the Via Della Rosa, or the Way of uh, Sorrows, uh, he was carrying his cross, and there was a heckler in the crowd that kept heckling him. And he finally dropped his cross and went over and punched the guy in the mouth. And he went back to carrying the cross up the hill. Well, after the play was over, the director said, hey, we can't have our Jesus punching people in the mouth, so mouth I'm going to have to fire you. So he said, please don't, you know, I really like this, I believe I can do this. And so... The director gave him one more chance, and the next day, they did it every day. He was carrying this cross, and the same heckler was there talking to him. And you could see the guy was getting madder and madder. He was clenching his fist, and he was you know, grinding his teeth. And finally, he couldn't take any more. He looked over at him, and he goes, you, you meet me after the resurrection, and we'll finish this. See, you know, that's kind of the way it is. You know, we're, we're told all, into, all along, all the time, that we're supposed to behave like Christians. We're supposed to act like Christ. We're supposed to be people that exercise certain things. So here we are in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 31st verse. It says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. He said, covet earnestly the best gifts, but yet I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Now remember the whole 12th chapter, he talked about being apostles, being prophets, being teachers, being workers of miracles, and having the gifts to work in the church to edify the body of Christ. He goes, covet those things, but I'm going to show you a more excellent way. I'm going to show you a better way than that even. In the 13th chapter, the first verse says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity or have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So what is that more excellent way? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to read from your holy anointed word. We ask, Lord, that you anoint us from the top of our feet, the top of our head to the sole of our feet, to say the words you would have us to say. Anoint the ears of the people to hear these words and hide it in their heart. And, Lord, we ask that anybody out there in Radio Land, anybody out there on Facebook, anybody in this congregation, Lord, we ask that you let them keep this word. Lord, as we go forth to be a light to this lost and dying world. Lord, we pray for the men and women in Congress. We pray for our president. We pray for the men and women in uniform that you put a protective hedge over them, a covering over them to keep them safe as they keep us free so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we'll not fail to give you the praise and the glory for all you do in Christ's precious holy name. Amen. Amen. See, sometimes it's hard for us who profess to be Christians to be carrying our cross down the way. And when somebody heckles us and when somebody makes fun of us, it's real easy for us to behave like the guy did in the passion play. We want to drop our cross. We want to go punch somebody in the mouth because it will make us feel better. But as we get to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and the, 
this, uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the second verse, it says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. It says, With all lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love. In Hebrews, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the 14th verse, it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men. So what's he telling us? He's saying, be humble, be gentle, be patient, be kind. You're reaching out to a lost and dying world. You know, when what these verses are saying, hey, it's going to be difficult. Hey, it's going to be, you know, some effort on your part. But you need to reach out there and you need to love this world. You need to try to get along with this world. You need to try to be able to do these things so that they can see the love of Jesus Christ in me. See, they don't need to see Houston. They need to see Jesus in Houston. They don't need to see us. They need to see Jesus in us. And that's the reason Paul wrote this 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He said, hey, I've told you about these mysteries and these things that are good for the church, but I'm going to show you a more excellent way. I'm going to show you a more excellent way. So it says, what is the importance of love in our life? As we look at this first verse, he said, hey, I'm going to show you the best way to take care of virtually every situation you come in contact with. I'm going to show you the best way. See, he points out love is more important than at least four things that we as Christians think are really, really important. He's going to show us that love is more important than anything else. And in this first verse of this 13th chapter, it says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, it says... It's more important than spiritual gifts. Now remember in the day of Pentecost. Remember when they poured out of that upper room and they were speaking in unknown tongues. And Peter stood up in the midst of that crowd. And they were witnessing to people from Galilee and Judea. And they were listening, witnessing to people from Greece. And witnessing to Jews from Egypt. They were speaking in all these foreign languages. So that the word of Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ could get out there amongst all those things. What Paul is saying is, hey, even if I speak with all these unknown tongues... And I don't have love, then I become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. See, way back in the first century, way back in the first century, we've all seen those kung fu movies where they got these big old gongs outside of these Shaolin temples. And they would take a big thing and they what are they doing that for? They're doing that to wake up their fake God. They're doing that to wake up their God so that when they pray, this fake God can hear this. So what Paul's saying is even if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, is if I speak the prettiest words that can be spoken, if I can speak in every language that you can speak in, if I do that and I don't have love, then I'm just trying to wake up a false god. I'm just trying to make a bunch of noise to wake up a false god. Think about how ridiculous that is. That's what he's saying. I'm just becoming a, a clanging, noisy symbol. I'm just making all kinds of stuff. See, love is more important than any spiritual gift. That's why he said, seek ye the best gifts, but yet I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Then in verse 2, he says it's more important than knowledge. He says, and if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. He said, if I understand all that. And in 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, the first verse, it says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Knowledge puffs us up, but love builds us up. And that's what he's saying. So Paul is saying here in this second verse, even if I've got the gift of prophecy and I understand all mystery and I have all knowledge, if I don't have love, then I've got nothing to be, I've got nothing to be bragging about. It doesn't matter if I understand everything about medicine. It doesn't matter if I understand everything about nuclear physics. It doesn't matter if I understand every psychology and sociology and every other ology out there. It doesn't matter. If I don't have enough love, none of that stuff matters. The second thing, you know, the hearts of the people will never, ever change without knowledge. But they definitely will never, ever change without love. See, they've got to know the truth. But you've got to love them enough that they want to hear the truth. See, too many times we want to point a finger and go, you're going straight to hell. 
If you don't change your ways, all that is true. But they're not going to listen to that lecture coming from us. Because what Jesus said there when he got down and he started scratching in the dirt when they were wanting to stone that lady, what was it? He that was without sin cast the first stone. See, we shouldn't be throwing stones at people. We shouldn't be doing all that other stuff. We need to be li listening to them. We need to be hearing them. We need to be loving them. And we need to be telling them what Jesus Christ says. Because a lot of times when we're up here shaking our finger at them, a lot of times when we're telling them what the Word of God says, they think it's coming from us. They think it's a rebuke from us. They think it's a judgment from us. So they've got to know that first and foremost that we love them and we love their souls. We've got to make sure that they understand that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, a lot of times that gets lost in the message. A lot of times that gets lost because we're worried about all that stuff. The third thing that Paul says love is more important than is faith. Now, I'm not saying faith isn't important. Faith is very important. It says there in that second verse, it says, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. If I've got enough faith to move a mountain, but I don't love you. If I've got enough faith to move any situation, but I don't love you, then I'm nothing. If I have enough faith to do everything, oh, Brother Houston, I want you to pray for me that the Lord heals me. But if I don't love you enough to care enough to pray for you, that prayer is not going to do you any good. See, that faith isn't going to do you any good. We need to, we need to re realize this in our life. We need to put this down and realize we've got to love people for everything else that goes on in the Word of God to matter, for everything else to become effective in our life. We have to have love. We have to have love. So too many times, if we just look at it, what is your faith in today? What is your faith in today? Is your faith in government? You know, I'm not saying faith isn't important, but what is your faith? What do you believe? Do you believe that God is the creator of the world? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Do you believe that Jesus came down here and lived a sinless life? That he was hung on an old rugged cross for our sins? That he rose again on the third day. And then he went back to his father and he's been preparing a place for you and I ever since. So that where he is, we can be also. If you believe that, I'm proud of you. But if you believe that, you don't have love in your heart. All that faith doesn't matter. If you believe all those things, it's great. What about the parable of the Good Samaritan? Do you think the Pharisee had some religion? You think the Levite had some religion? But they didn't have love. They saw that man beaten and robbed and laid on the ditch, and they crossed the other side of the road. They didn't care if he lived or died. See, it doesn't matter about how much religion we've got. People don't care about how much religion we've got. I tell people all the time, it's not about religion. We can be religious about taking out the trash. Every Monday night, I go down to my mom's house and drive my son down there so he can put out her trash. Because she lives on a hill, and I'm not dragging that trash can up a hill. I'm going to let him. But we're religious about it. We do it every week. Yeah. But being religious isn't the same as being saved. Being religious isn't the same as having a relationship with God. See, we've got to have a relationship with God. That's what, that's what that faith is supposed to be based in, is the fact that God loved me enough to send his son to die for me. And I receive that sacrifice for my sins. I receive that. That's what faith is all about. See, we can believe all the right things. But if we don't have love, it doesn't matter. Galatians, the fifth chapter, the sixth verse. It says, For Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. See, we've got to have that faith. The only thing that counts is the faith that works by love. He says, it doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised, if you're not circumcised. The only thing that counts is that your faith is worked by your love. See, that's important. See, and fourthly, the fourth thing that love is more important than is generosity. 
A lot of people think, oh, if I'm generous enough, if I put enough money in the offer plate, if I pay my 10%. But listen to what he says in this third verse. He said, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. See, he's not saying just give your 10%. He's saying take everything that you have, empty out your bank accounts, cash in your life insurance policies, sell your car, give everything that you've got to the poor. It won't do you a blessed bit of good if you don't have love in your heart. He said, it doesn't matter if you give your body up to be sacrificed. It doesn't matter if you hang at the stake and they set you on fire. If you don't have the love of God in your heart, it's not going to do you any good. See, he didn't say just do a little bit. He said, you got to have love. See, what does that mean? Maybe we need to examine ourselves. Are we giving the 10% because the preacher made us feel guilty because he preached a sermon on tithing? Do we give money to those TV commercials because they made us cry? Why are you giving? Are you giving so you look important in the eyes? Of, oh, you, you dr drop the money in the offer so that somebody else can see it? Like the Pharisee we talked about this morning? I thank God that I'm not a worthless sinner like this publican is. No, if we do all this stuff, it doesn't matter if we don't have the love of Jesus in our heart. We need to do that. We can't give only to benefit ourselves. We have to give because we love God. We have to give because we love the people of God. We have to give because we love. That's the reason we give. We don't give, we don't give out of some, oh, it's like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills this month. Oh, if the church, I need this money more than they do. Well, then keep it. God will provide. Give out of love. It doesn't matter. You can give everything you've got. And it says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, if I don't have love, if I don't have love, it profiteth me nothing. If I'm not giving out of love, it's not doing me any good. That's what that says. Amen. So how do we do that? How do we practice love in our everyday life? Well, love's important. Love's maybe more important than we ever realized. Love may be more important than we can ever possibly imagine. But John, the 13th chapter, the 34th verse, we've all heard this, and it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. A new commandment. He gave us a commandment. He said, love one another as I have loved you, and he said it again in the next sentence, that ye also love one another. Love one another, love one another. He, it wasn't a suggestion, it was a commandment. He said, a new commandment I give you. It wasn't, oh, if you get around to it, oh, maybe you can do it. See, we tend to think because we've heard songs all of our life that love is just something that happens. Love is something you fall into like a ditch or something that you fall out of like a tree. You know, we heard Elvis say, I can't help falling in love with you. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us to love. We, it's something that we can help. We can do it. You know, the Beatles said, hello, I love you. Won't you tell me your name? You go through all that stuff. You've lost your loving feeling. We can talk about all those other songs. It makes us think that it's something that we can fall out of or fall into. But the Bible says that love is something that we can practice. Love is something that we can control. Or he wouldn't have commanded us to love one another. If we couldn't control it, it's like, I go, Keith, stop breathing. And just hold your breath for 10 minutes. We can't help that. We're going to start breathing or we're going to turn, we're going to turn blue, pass out, and start breathing anyway. Okay? But he said, I command you to love one another, which means it's something that we can control. It's just like when I t used to tell my daughter, pick up your toys. I wouldn't have told her to pick up her toys if she wasn't able to pick up her toys and put them where they're supposed to be. That was sometimes an argument. But it was something that she was capable of doing. So when he tells us to love one another, that is something that we are capable of turning on and turning off. See, a lot of times we're like, well, I'd love them, but I really don't like them. I don't care. The Bible says love them. The Bible says that's a commandment that I'm going to give you. Philippians, the second chapter, the fourth verse. 
It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. See, what kind of love is that talking about? It's like, don't just pay attention to your stuff. Pay attention to your brothers and sisters stuff too. See, in other words, love the same way that Jesus loved. See, love the same way that Jesus loved. Yeah. Jesus cared about us more than we'll ever possibly know. So how could that work? Well, let's just say, look at around today, all the families represented in here, and if just one person from each family would practice love, go home and practice it on your spouse. Seriously. I, I hear some chuckles, but think about that. No matter how big a jerk they're acting, I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> no, just say, I love you. And start just, I love you, whatever, and start looking at them as you would look at yourself. Yeah. And then pretty soon, that love spills over to the relationship with your children. And that may spill over to your in-laws. And then that may spill over to your church family. That may spill over to your work family. And the next thing you know, that commandment that you said, I give you to love one another, gets to be easier and easier and easier. It filters down into every aspect of our life. That's what he's talking about. I command you to love. So how do we get better at something? We get better at something because we practice at it. And we got to do it right. There's an old saying that practice makes perfect. Well, what practice makes is permanent. If you're practicing the wrong things, you're going to be doing the wrong things forever and ever. But we need to practice to make things permanent. We need to practice the right things and make those things permanent. So we got to practice loving our brothers and sisters. we got to practice doing the things that God has commanded us to do. And Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. And the very next verse in that 35th verse of that 13th chapter of John it says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Think about that. Do people know that you're a Christian by the way you love each other? Do people recognize that? You know, that's what he said. If the world really is going to hear the message of Jesus Christ, it's got to come from disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples of this fancy word for followers of Jesus Christ. But if we're out there running this thing, you know, between our teeth about other brothers and sisters in Christ, what's the chance of them listening to us? Oh, they'll want to hear the gossip, but they're not going to hear you tell them about Jesus. Oh, they'll want to hear what you got to say, but they, they, don't, they don't want to hear all the other stuff. A friend of mine that I work with, his grandson, he's got a five-year-old grandson. And they watched Free Willy the other day. Now, Free Willy's been out 20-some years. And he said that five-year-old had never seen it. And he pulled a little chair up in front of the TV, and he sat almost nose to nose. And he laughed at the right places. He cried in the right places. He clapped his hands. He got so involved in it that he became part of the story. See, and that's what Jesus is telling us. We need to have such compassion for one another that we become part of the story. We become part of the story. You know, we, we, then we'll have to start asking ourselves some tough questions. We'll have to start asking ourselves those tough questions. Is, what's, it, what's it like to be an addict? What's it like to be down and out? I'm going to pray for you because I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. What's it like to be, you know, sick and not know if you're ever going to get better? Not know if you're going to live or die? You know, have that kind of compassion that we can feel what they feel. And that way when we pray, because we love them, because we're reaching out to them, we'll know exactly how to pray. And we'll be reaching out and we'll be ringing the prayer bells of heaven. We'll be hanging on to the throne of heaven going, Lord, I need my brother saved. I need my sister healed. We'll be reaching out and Lord, deliver them. We'll cry with a whole new purpose because we love them with all of our heart and we're reaching out. See, a lot of times we don't pray as hard as we should because we don't understand what they're really going through. We think somehow that they deserve that. But we don't know what people in a bad domestic situation are going through. We don't know what some minorities may be going through. We may not know what some people with marital problems are going through. But if we have that love for them and we can develop that kind of compassion for them, then when we pray... When we pray, we'll ring on the prayer bells of heaven. As my wife comes to the piano, 
One more story. I promise this is it. There's a missionary. His name was Doug Nichols. And he was going to go to India. He was going to India, and he, he had all these grand plans. He brought all these Christian uh, tracks, and he bought, brought all kinds of literature. He was going to India, and he was going to spend like six, eight months and learn the language so that he could be able to preach and teach them in their own language. And within a couple weeks of getting there, he developed tuberculosis. And they put him in a sanitarium. And a sanitarium, uh, for those of you that don't know, is just a place where they kept people with TB so that uh, they would uh, not infect the rest of the population. So there he is laying in bed, feeling sorry for himself, wasn't able to speak the language yet, so he couldn't talk to anybody. And he tried to talk in the few little Indian words that he knew, and he tried to pass out his tracts and tried to pass out his literature, and nobody would have them. And he'd lay there and felt sorry for himself. And about 2 o'clock every morning, he'd wake up with a coughing fit. And he'd cough so hard and so violently that he'd wake up other people around him. They were in a great big old ward. There'd be like 20-some people, you know, 10 beds on each side facing each other. And the nurses would walk down. Well, one night he was coughing so bad that he sat up on the side of his bed. And, and across the aisle from him, he saw this little old Indian man. And he was trying to get out of bed. And he he would ball himself up and try to rock back and forth to get enough momentum to get up on the floor. And he tried for several minutes, and he would finally get tired and just lay, lay back down. And then the next morning, Doug found out why he did that. He was trying to get up and go to the bathroom, but he couldn't. He wasn't strong enough to get up, and he just would lay there in bed and wet himself and just cry. And all the patients the next morning was making fun of him because everybody knew what was going on. They could, see, they could see the stain. They could smell the smell. And even a couple of the nurses made fun of him. One of them even slapped him. So the next night at 2 o'clock, Doug woke up with his coughing fit. And the old man was trying to get out of bed. And he didn't want to, but he got up and he tried to help him out of bed. And he got him out of bed. And he couldn't walk on his own. But he was a very frail little man. So Doug literally picked him up and carried him to the bathroom like a baby. And he stood there over a hole in the floor, which was their bathroom, and he balanced him, and the old man was able to go to the bathroom. And when he was finished and took care of himself, Doug picked him back up and carried him back to bed and laid him down, and they both went to sleep. The next morning when he woke up, there was 15 patients and nurses around his bed wanting to know about the God that he worshipped, wanting to know about this Savior that he was trying to tell them about, and he was, he was in that sanitarium for more than a year waiting for his TB to clear up. And by the time he left, over half of the nurses and doctors were saved. Over half the patients that he came in contact with were saved. He goes, listen, I never preached a message in their language. I never witnessed a single one of them. But I got up and carried a man to the bathroom and carried him back to bed. And that's all I did. And more people were won to the Lord because of that. Why? Because people don't care about how much you know mm -hmm. until they know about how much you care. Mm -hmm. See, we've got to love this world to Jesus Christ. We've got to let this people know that we love them and there's a heaven to get to and there's a hell to miss. Mm -hmm. Let's all stand. I know this wasn't your typical Sunday morning message, but... That clock is ticking. And we're getting closer and closer to midnight. And there's a lost and dying world out there that needs to know about Jesus. That are in the darkness. And maybe you are the light that they need. But if we don't have love in our heart, we're just going to be like a clanging cymbal. We'll just be making noise no matter how pretty the words that we say are. Let's all come around the altar. Let's just have a good season of prayer. And if you already know Jesus Christ, just pray that he opens doors for you to witness to the lost. Amen. He counts the stars one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shore. He sees every sparrow that falls.